Google is a big company, of course, and for a lot of uh, young analysts and also, you know, uh, experienced. Hi guys, and welcome to another video by Mentor Me Careers. My name is Alan Arvindan, and I'm a CFA charter holder. And today we'll be covering the Crystal Equity Research interview. Right now, Crystal is a big company, of course, and for a lot of uh, young analysts and also you know uh, experienced analysts, this can be a company that uh, might be a very uh, fascinating company to work with, and for all the right reasons because Crystal is also a very good company uh, in terms of their governance and in, in terms of their employment opportunities and also in terms of the quality of work they actually do. Right? But obviously, having said that, if a company is good in those uh, fronts, it also makes it difficult to get into such companies. Right? And it does not become difficult uh, because uh, you know the company is uh, you know, expecting something from the sky, but it's all because the quality of the preparation has to be right. So that is exactly what we're going to solve that for you. So in this video, we'll cover first the types of roles which are available and I'm going to be touching on the basic uh, uh, roles which are related to the core finance. Then we'll talk about the interview process. We'll do some practice. Okay, and I'll also show you some of the questions which can be asked and you need to know the kind of level that should be expected at this interview and some deal breakers at the end, uh, which I have seen over the years uh, tend to affect uh, the performance of the student at the end. So first, let's understand what's the crystal structure, right? So we're talking about what does the company get into and what is the kind of services and businesses that crystal is actually involved in, right? So you can see that there is a, a business of ratings, which probably everybody of us might be aware of the SMP ratings. Then there is research, which is also divided into global research and domestic research. Then they have introduced over the years, uh, you know, business verticals and risk and analytics, right? Now, Obviously, we are restricting our discussion only with research. So let's look at one of the job profiles, uh, which is uh, research into emerging markets. Right Now, uh, just for notice uh, in terms of the selection for the research positions in Crystal, majorly they will require you to either have a CFA level 1, level 2 completed or even a CFA or the levels completed, maybe an MBA. That too, an MBA they would expect from an Ivy League college or even chartered accountants can actually apply right now if you look at the responsibilities right um, there are a lot of things which are written obviously you can read it yourself but what i will do at the end is trying to summarize the requirements this is the second job which obviously does not require the premium qualifications it's just that even a graduate can actually apply and that is something which is pretty uh you know interesting about crystal is because at some level they also tend to hire where they require you know these Ivy League qualification and these premium qualifications. But at the same time, they also hire graduates directly without any such need uh, for such premier qualifications, right? And this is one of them. Right. Now again, you can obviously read through all of those job requirements. That's not the purpose of the video. But I'm going to summarize these two and bring your focus into what kind of preparation needs to be done. Right. So first if you look at the interview process, uh, since Crystal never hires at a very large mass scale volume based uh, hiring, so they do not really start uh, by an aptitude test. Okay, so instead, what they do is they have a heavy, uh, you know, work which gets done at the shortlisting process itself. So they spend a lot of time looking at the profile and you know whether the qualification matches, whether the academic uh, score matches, etc., and then they move into directly doing the face-to-face -face round first. Okay, so that's a little different from, let's say, a Morningstar company, which, uh, you know, will do a lot of tests at the first. And then whoever clears that test, they will do the face-to-face -face round. And post that, they will send you a case. Once you're done with your face-to-face -face round, and based on whatever you have committed, you know, it's tested on the case. Right? Now, the case is also not as straightforward as an MCQ case. It's basically your test which uh, will test your uh, understanding of the financial models. Okay, And then obviously you get uh, the offer letter. Right? Now let's look at the preparation areas. Now I've, in the class also, I tend to focus this a lot in giving the students an idea that if you want to get into companies like Crystal and there are other companies which research at this level, I don't want to take names at this stage, but uh, 
you know, the first and the most biggest criteria which the candidate misses on is the business depth. Okay, now, and whenever I say this business depth, uh, you know, people tend to get confused as to what do I mean, right? So, because they feel that they understand business. And I'm going to give you some questions. You're going to be seeing some questions which will probably clarify that what business depth I am talking about is not the same as what you might possibly perceive. All right. So one is, uh, if you can see here, I'm talking about revenue drivers, sectoral knowledge, sector opinion, hidden truths about businesses. Right. So that's the level of research and understanding of businesses which is required. And then obviously you need the financial modeling skill, but that too at an application level, not just that you've just made a financial model, but you know you understand the depths of how a financial model gets made in real life. Okay. Then, as I've always stressed, any company nowadays, because most of these companies tend to service US and European clients, your ability to communicate is of prime importance for you to crack this job. Right. So now let's get into some interview questions. Now, these interview questions are created based on my experience uh, of interviewing also and plus also our experience with our own candidates uh, you know, applying for various equity research positions, including this. But in, this is in no way that I have copied these interview questions from somewhere and I am giving it to you. Okay. So, uh, the first question is, what company model have you made? To lead and walk us through. Right now, here, uh, let's say I am working on Titan. Let's say I made a Titan model. Okay? There's also one of the models I've actually covered in the class. Okay. Now, when an interviewer says that, you know, okay, you have made a model in Titan, walk us through the business. How would you explain that? Because you can't really say I copied the income statement, balance sheet, cash flow data, and then I just put it into the um, you know sheet, and then I took an average. Uh, growth rate, whichever the company was generating, and then I took it also ahead in the coming three years. That's not what exactly has been asked. In this. So, first and foremost, you should be talking about what sector does this business lie on, right? And if you actually see this company properly, you will see that you can't really classify this into the consumer side. So, this is majorly, you can say, a jewelry business, right? Because Believe it or not, that is where the formalization of business is what Titan has been trying to achieve over here. And I'll explain it a little further also. Right? Then I spoke about the sector. Then I say that, okay, they have various revenue segments out of which one segment is, let's say, the eyewear. Then they have watches. Then they have jewelry. If I were to simplify this segment. And they've also recently got into the saris business. At this stage, I would say that although these are the various segments of their businesses, but there is a big strategy in the jewelry and saris business because remember, since the uh, since we have implemented GST, you have seen that a lot of small companies, okay, are struggling, and they are struggling because of a big problem which is working capital. Now I will explain this further. What do I mean by this? So for example, a small jeweler in any gully of India would you know, have to buy the gold first or lease it out or whatever, but he has to pay some cost for it. All right? And then he has to make it and then he has to sell it. So in the process, what is happening is there's a lot of money which is getting stuck right? because he has to pay for buying the gold, then he has to pay his labor charges and then he has to sell it. right? And this is what Python business actually understood and what they did is instead of doing this, they formalized it by acquiring a company called as Cartlin. You must be aware of Cartlin. Now in this, what they do is they do not purchase the gold they would have some sample sets available in the shop. But eventually what they do is uh, they just show you a list of kind of designs on an iPad. So basically there is no uh, inventory which is pre-created. Right? 
Now these designs, the customer has to pay an advance. Okay, so the customer pays an advance. Now this advance finally gets routed to the small jewelers. So basically they do not make themselves the entire jewelry set, then they will outsource it to someone else. And in three days, the piece will be ready, right? So that's a big game because now what they're trying to do is they're trying to take the jewelry market and they're trying to formalize it, right? And they realize that the same opportunity is also available in the sari segment because again, the market is fragmented and there's no clear indication as to who is the biggest player. So if they're able to formalize this, the sari market itself is a $50 billion market. In the jewelry market segment, they have a market share of about 8%. So if now remember in this interview, I'm explaining the model, right? So what I feel is that in terms of the formalization of such sectors, the company is going to be an excellent company. Plus, if you also talk about the corporate governance, right? they have an excellent corporate governance structure. Uh, wherein all of their committees, which are important committees like the audit committees are independent. Second is if you talk about their free cash flow to their operating profit is in upwards of 60%, which is great. That means there is less receivables, uh, which is a good sign. Then the leverage is very low, right? So their leverage is almost nil, right? Plus, in terms of their uh, till date contingent liabilities are also minimal. Right? So basis on this, I made the model and I forecasted a growth rate. I have, I calculated the intrinsic value on whatever the model calculation that I've done. And this is my, uh, you know, understanding of the Titan. This is how you should be explaining your model rather than just talking about your calculation flow. All right. Let's talk about what filters or ratios would you use to filter high growth, low risk and good corporate companies. Now, here the question is related to ratio analysis. That's why I say uh, constantly to students that whenever you are learning ratio analysis, it has to be with some purpose. It's not, it's not that you just mug up the ratios and then you tell the formula because in real life, that's not the objective. The objective is to filter out companies, right? Remember, even on an Excel filter, what are you doing? You're trying to set a filter and then you're trying to get, you know, whatever basis the conditions are met. Those are the kind of companies that you want to really work for. So if you were to use the ratios, which have uh, ratios, which would give you this kind of companies, what would that ratios be? So you have to think in four terms. One is solvency, because this is where the ratios are, right? Solvency ratios liquidity ratios, then you have uh, turnover ratios or activity ratios, right? Uh, and you have your valuation ratios, right? So now we are looking at high growth companies. So maybe uh, in the high growth companies, you don't really need a ratio, you just need sales growth. Maybe a sales growth, an average sales growth of 10%, 10 years should be greater than 10%, right? In the valuation, instead of talking about the price and earning multiple, we could also use the FCFF divided by price or price divided by FCFF. Lower the better, generally below uh, 70 would be a cheaper. I mean, that means it's reasonable. They are not cheaper because these are good companies, so they'll never be cheaper. Then you, if you want to understand whether the business is actually buying the assets and what do you expect? You expect to generate revenue. So in that case, you are looking at asset turnover ratio or revenue upon assets. It should be at least greater than one. Because at least you should be generating one rupee for each asset that you're adding, right? Then if you look at, uh, you know, low risk, then you want to have a debt to equity ratio less than 0.5, okay, which is decent. And then finally, if you're looking at, corp, uh, you know, well, good corporate government companies, then you can also look at their audit committees. So audit committee, is it chaired by the promoter? First point, 
second point uh, is the company provisioning for receivables because if the company has a lot of receivables and the company is not provisioning that means the company is those receivables don't exist and they want to manipulate the earnings right third you want to look at what is the remuneration of the auditor fees is the auditor fees high is it sequentially increasing fourth is you want to look at who is the auditor it should be a reputed auditor and finally the related to the auditor itself whether the auditor has changed frequently so that's a very detailed answer right now let's look at now this is a general market understanding that you know shows whether you are really interested in finance or not so what is our opinion on the uh, indian economy for the next one year right now that requires you to follow certain videos certain research reports which are written on this right so you could actually use this uh, this is the reason why i have put this screenshot out here so you can actually use it for this preparation so first of all at a broader level you have to understand that india uh, well the whole world is going through a uh, higher inflation and higher interest rates in india specifically your uh, policy rates are somewhere around 7% and inflation is somewhere around 6.5% that means more uh, most likely interest rates will not increase further uh, at least in india right now if you want to look at specific numbers then quarter 3 uh, quarter 3 gdp has grown by 4.4% right and uh, implied growth rate is expected for quarter 4 as quarter 5 4 as 5.1 and fy23 most of the analysts are expecting it to be at 7% real okay now what are the levers of the growth we are expecting so you are seeing a big way in the services segment so that has to be known to you right now Uh, formal sector employment growth seems to be slowing as indicated by the sequential fall in the epfo new payrolls when we are saying formal it means major is it and real estate right so that is growing which is pretty evident because of the us recession that is happening with the potential threat of heat wave impacting harvest so there is a effect of el nino right it tends to affect uh, you know our agriculture produce whenever we have an el nino effect that will have an effect on your agriculture produce and plus at the same time you will probably expect higher inflation and if higher inflation happens then you can expect a increase in interest rates which will most likely cause a uh, again a deceleration of growth right now what is your opinion on pfsi sector now this is one sector which has grown significantly and has a bright future because of uh, a lot of reforms which have happened in the past for the banking sector which specifically in terms of npa right so and you can see here that the npa is at a 7 year low this should be known to you as a finance student right very important now uh, you can see here the net interest uh, income growth leading to better treasury gains which is pretty obvious because right now interest rates have increased right and if the interest rates have increased obviously that also means that the income of the banks have increased right uh, so there's a deposit growth of about 11% uh, which continues to lag advanced growth leading to higher cd ratio that, that much of information is not required but at a very broad level you need to understand that the npa is the main game because that was where uh you know the indian banking system was struggling big time since 2013 and after that uh, a lot of uh, you know steps taken by rbi and multiple governors change that has led to the improvement of overall uh you know outlook for the bfsi sector right let's look at your overall el nino effect which is going to affect your rural economy so that is something which you should know that whenever you can see here uh this is this column talks about all the rainfalls in you know the various years in terms of as a percentage of normal rainfall i can see here uh post 15 you had an 86% normal rainfall 2018 you had a 91% no, uh, you know rainfall and percentage of districts with deficit so that was even in 2018 you had a 38% deficit right 
Now, in 2015, you had a uh, El Nino effect, which had caused 49% of uh, deficit in your rainfall. So that can affect your economy a big time. And probably there's a forecast that probably El Nino will have a big effect in 2023, but that has to be watched. Okay, now let's talk about a sample case of, of instead of just knowing financial modeling. That's why I say that understanding financial mod modeling just is not going to be enough to crack this interview. Right? So that was the case. Now, the deal breakers for the Crystal interview is always the lack of depth, lack of interest, lack of reading, and lack of drive and hard work. Right? So I'm going to give you some solutions for that. If you want to build your depth towards accounting, right? so you should read a book called as Accounting Shenanigans. Uh, it's related to accounting forensics, for example, the ratios which we spoke about, uh, how to read the financial statements and look out for problems, especially for analysts, that's a very good book to read. And to understand how businesses run, uh, I'm not giving you a finance book. This is a book written by Peter Thiel and it's called as Zero to One, right? So those is this is basically the entire uh, you know interview preparation for Crystal and related companies which you can do and best of luck. And if you like this video, please like, subscribe and share and also press the bell button so that you are updated whenever our new video is launched. I'll see you again.